Next, I'm uh, delighted to introduce Professor Mariana Fontana. So Mariana is the director of uh, the UCL CMR unit at the Royal Free Hospital. She's also a professor of cardiology and an honorary consultant cardiologist at the National Amyloidosis Centre. Um, and I think uh, Mariana has huge expertise in the assessment and disease management of amyloids. So Mariana, if you are there in the background, if we can invite you up to the to the stage, please, to take uh, the forefront. Um, and whilst we just get up, set up, so it's, I mean, we've had some fantastic speakers so far. Um, please do pop any questions in the chat and and we hopefully after Mariana's talk, we'll be able to open up the uh, session really for further discussion. So really get your brains working to think about what questions you have and, and anything, whether it be clinically applicable, whether it be something uh, scientific based, because we have the experts here. So use the opportunity while we can. Now, fantastic. Thank you very much, very much, Mariana. Um, the floor is over to you. Uh, thank you so much for um, this invitation to speak and for the very kind introduction. So today yes, I will speak about the diagnostic journey, genetic testing and novel treatment focusing on ATTR amyloidosis. So when we think about ATTR amyloidosis, uh, it's an example of a disease where the pathobiology is very well known. So what happens is that we have a protein which is normally produced by the liver, transtyretin, that for a condition which only, only partly understood misfolds and deposits as amyloid into the different organ and tissues. We have two types of ATTR amyloidosis. One is wild type ATTR amyloidosis, where uh, the phenotype is a predominant cardiomyopathy. So it's an increasing recognized cause of heart failure, especially in the elderly, and it's a progressively fatal condition between three to five years, but actually when there is over cardiac involvement is between two and five years. Exocardiac features include carpal tunnel syndrome and lumbar canal stenosis. And uh, we know that autopsies in patients older than 85, 25% uh, of patients will have some amyloid deposits. But it's crucial to understand the difference between amyloid deposits and actually cardiac amyloidosis, which is the syndrome associated with extensive amyloid deposition. The second type of transarytic amyloidosis is hereditary ATTR amyloidosis. And hereditary TTR amyloidosis uh, is uh, uh, characterized by presence of variant in the TTR gene and is estimated uh, to affect 50,000 patients worldwide. We know that there are more than 130 mutations uh, in the TTR gene which are associated with the disease, uh, and one of the and two of the most common ones in the UK are B12Y, which is present in up to 4% of patients with Afro Caribbean origin, and T60A, which is more prevalent in the white British populations of uh, Irish origin. As concerned hereditary TTR amyloidosis, as we said, we've identified 130 mutations, uh, more than 130 mutations now, and there is definitely a possible genotypic to phenotypic association where certain mutations have been traditionally um, associated with a more neuropathic phenotype and other mutations have been traditionally associated with a cardiomyopathic phenotype. But now we know that most mutations have a mixed phenotype, so presence of cardiomyopathy and polyneuropathy in the same patient. So wild peripheral neuropathy and autonomic dysfunction is what has a dramatic impact on the quality of life of the patients is really the presence of cardiac involvement which drives survival. Once cardiac involvement is uh, present, uh, then the survival is between 2.5 and 4 years. So early diagnosis uh, is becoming increasingly important to actually improve outcomes. But then how do we identify a TTR amyloidosis? So there are exocardiac red flags, which are very important. So bilateral carpal tunnel syndrome is invariably present. Uh, spinal stenosis is very common. Cardiomyopathy with polyneuropathy or autonomic dysfunction, again, should raise a suspicion. Bicep tendon rupture. Or, or weight loss. And some of these are more characteristic of the hereditary type, like the neuropathy, the autonomic dysfunction, vitreal opacity or glaucoma, but others are more prevalent in patients with a cardiomyopathic phenotype and wild type PTTR amyloidosis, like carpal tunnel syndrome and spinal stenosis. So echocardiography is the first imaging modality that we do in all patients who present with these conditions. And what we typically see is increase in LP mass, a characteristic reduction in the longitudinal function as opposed to the radial contraction, which is usually relatively preserved. And, uh, and uh, the diastolic uh, dysfunction is usually severely impaired. Usually this patient presents with a restrictive feeling pattern. But if we want to add specificity to the echocardiographic examination, then we should do strain. 
And we're longitudinal strain, what we do, we assess the extent and timing of the myocardial deformation during systole. And what we typically see in these patients is reduction in, in the longitudinal strain of the basal and mid segment with preservation of the longitudinal strain in the apical segment. And this gives a very typical bullseye appearance when we display those in the polar plot map. However, Whilst with echocardiography, we can stratify the probability of amyloid, it's absolutely impossible just based on echo to say out of 10 patients, uh, this one specifically has got cardiac amyloid. So what do we do? In medical school, we've been taught that the gold standard to confirm cardiac amyloidosis is to do a cardiobiopsy. But cardiobiopsy is really rarely done in the UK, especially in the UK, and it's also done by 10 stage. We don't do it early on in the disease. So one could say, OK, let's go for a screening biopsy, like a fat biopsy or a rectal biopsy. But if we think about fat biopsy, the sensitivity is very low, as low as 15% in wild type and a bit higher in heterotity amyloidosis, 45%. But since uh, such a low sensitivity is not really useful when we think about uh, a diagnostics test. So the, what, but let's assume we go for a cardiobiopsy. Let's, let's assume we decide to do it. The results we get is not always the correct one. What we found in an audit across the UK is that we get 25% of false, neg false positive results. So one in four times the pathology will say, the pathologist will say amyloid is there, but actually there's no amyloid. And 10% of the time we will get a false negative results. So in one in 10 cases, the pathology will say there's no amyloid when the amyloid is there. But the challenges don't stop here because then the typing is extremely complex. Most pathology departments will use histology and immunostochemistry, but you need a high expertise to actually assess those. And really, the gold standard is becoming mass spectrometry, which is not really widely available. In the UK, it's done clinically only in one pathology lab, which is here at the Emledusi Centre. So then how do we overcome the challenges related to biopsy? Cardiac MRI and bone scintigraphy have completely transformed our non-invasive pathway to diagnose ATTR amyloidosis. So the first one is cardiac MR, and, and uh, the reasons why I discussed before cardiac MR is because when we think about the diagnostic pathway, cardiac MR comes really in as soon as we suspect clinically, as soon as we see clinically an amphitrophic phenotype and we want to know if it's amyloid or something else. And CMR is extremely useful because we'll give you an answer, yes, it's amyloid, no, it's not amyloid, but also we'll give you information on the wide range of differential that do exist in the amphitrophic phenotype. And after we get contrast, the, the tissue characterization finding is extremely typical. What we find is uh, we find that the Blood it becomes black at the same time as the myocardium, which is defined as oligomene kinetics. And also we see a line of enhancement throughout the subendocardium or throughout the myocardium. And these are features that are entirely typical of cardiac amyloid. The other imaging modality which completely transformed the non-invasive approach to this condition is bone scintigraphy. And what we do with bone scintigraphy is very simple. We give a bone tracer to look for any evidence of cardiac uptake. So we see cardiac uptake. We normally we don't see any cardiac uptake, but in these patients we start to see a cardiac uptake and a decrease in the bone uptake. So we define grade one as mild cardiac uptake with no attenuation in the bone, two moderate cardiac uptake greater than the bone, and three strong cardiac uptake with little or no bone signal. And so how do we diagnose cardiac amyloidosis? So how do we use that algorithm in clinical practice? This is probably the most important paper published in terms of diagnosis and TTR amyloidosis. And what this multinational collaboration establishes is that if we suspect cardiac amyloidosis of ATTR type, we should do a bone scintigraphy. And if we find a grade two or three bone scintigraphy in the absence of a plasma cell dyscrasia, then we can confirm a diagnosis of cardiac ATTR amyloidosis without the need of any biopsy. The only extra step we need to do is TTR genotyping, but it's absolutely essential to, to do all the three tests that need to be done to exclude the plasma cell dyscrasia, which is serum and urine immunofixation and serum three layer chains. It's, it's like I get so many times asked the question by cardiologists, but do we really need to do the urine or the immunofixation instead of the electrophoresis? It's absolutely crucial to do immunofixation as opposed to electrophoresis in the blood and urine and serum free light chains. Because if any of these is positive, then AL is in the differentials. 
So we use that algorithm in 70% of the cases, so we don't do any biopsy in 70% of the cases, but still in 30% we need to biopsy. And why is that? Because if we find any evidence of possibility of a plasma cell dyscrasia, we need to go for a cardiac biopsy. So 30% of the patients are still diagnosed using histology. But then once we confirm the diagnosis, what do we use in terms of treatment strategies? So when we think again about the pathophysiology and the pathophysiology of the, of the disease, so how the, the transthyretin protein then misfolds and deposits um, in, into the different organ and tissues of amyloid, then we understand that where we can target from a therapeutic approach uh, this, uh, this pathway. We can suppress the production of TTR, we can stabilize the TTR, so inhibit the misfolding, or we could actually also target existing deposits. The only drug which is currently approved for the treatment of patients with a TTR cardiomyopathy is a TTR stabilizer, which is called Tefamidis. So the approval of Tefamidis is in the, on the back of this study published in 2018 in the New England Journal of Medicine. And uh, Tefamidis, this is a, a multi-center, multinational placebo control trial with a primary endpoint of glucose mortality and frequency of cardiovascular-related hospitalization at 30 months. And what they found is that uh, tefamidis was associated with a reduction in the uh, composite endpoint, uh, but also a reduction in the rate of disease progression in terms of reduction in the six men of test and quality of life. And this was extremely important because it was the first drug to be able to, dis to modify the disease, um, the natural history of disease in patients with a TTR cardiomyopathy. But other compounds are emerging, and these compounds target actually the production itself of, of TTR from the liver. But then why a TTR amyloidosis has really become a beautiful example, a prototype clinical indications of, uh, of companies which focus on uh, gene silencers, which is uh, really reducing the production of, of amyloid from the liver. First, because there was an unequivocal link between protein and disease. Secondly, because we knew that TTR was likely to be beneficial. Third, because uh, the TTR is just produced by the liver, so we had a very good vehicle to deliver the compound to the liver itself. And also we knew that no knocking down the TTR was thought to be safe. So then uh, Yonis embarked in this uh, uh, large global study on patients with ATTR polyneuropathy, so neuropathic phenotype, and there was evidence of reduction in disease progression in patients with this condition. At roughly the same time, Alnylam with a very similar compound, Patisiran, embarked in a large global study in patients again with neuropathy, and they showed very similar findings, but this time some of the patients actually showed improvement in the neuropathic symptoms. And uh, from a postdoc analysis of the Alnylam study, the Apollo study, in uh, the so-called subcardiac population, uh, there was evidence of a significant reduction uh, in uh, all-cause hospitalization and mortality, and also in the composite rate of cardiac hospitalization and all-cause mortality. So within this postdoc analysis, they were able to show that actually this drug uh, could have been beneficial in patients with a cardiomyopathic phenotype. So using gene silencers to reduce CTR production could have been beneficial not only in patients with neuropathy, but also in patients with cardiomyopathy. So um, Daniel Nylon went on and uh, uh, published the results of the Apollo B trial. The manuscript is not published yet, uh, but the results had been uh, uh, presented uh, uh, almost a year ago and showed actually that the uh, patisiran could also be beneficial in patients with cardiomyopathy. And very recently at the ESC Congress also results on uh, of another trial like Ramedes, uh, which is a TTR stabilizer, showed that also this second stabilizer could be very effective in patients with a cardiomyopathic phenotype. But the field is really trying to go a step further. And uh, TTR has been the first example of uh, uh, a genome editing trial in humans. So it was the first time that we tried a compound which was actually changing the genome, so the DNA permanently in the liver cells. This was done with NTLA2001, which is designed to deliver a single guide RNA using the Cas9 enzyme into the nucleus to precisely edit and inactivate the TTR gene in the liver. 
And so this paper, which was published in the New England Journal of Medicine last year, was important not, not just for patients with ACT amyloidosis, but was really the first time that genome editing was done in humans. And uh, the last, uh, um, the last kind of therapeutic approach is actually to remove the existing deposits. So recently there was the publication of a phase one trial of neuroimmune of an antibody which targets the existing deposits. The results were very promising, was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, but really what we're waiting for is large double blind placebo controlled trial phase three to prove that also these uh, uh, therapeutic approach could be effective in not only delaying disease progression, but actually bringing about improvement in this population population. So in summary, cardiac ATTR amyloidosis is emerging as an undiagnosed cause of heart failure. And there are two main types, one type and hereditary TTR amyloidosis, which have a different phenotype, natural history and prognosis. So imaging has completely transformed the non-invasive uh, treatment uh, diagnostic pathways, and this has also led in a change in the population, i.e. now we see patients at, with an earlier clinical phenotype. And so we're really going from a largely un unrecognized and unmanaged disease to early diagnosis, early treatment initiation, and uh, the future is very bright because in the next five years, we're likely to have not just one compound to treat this condition, but several compounds that can be used at different stage of, of the disease. Thank you very much for the attention. Fantastic. Thank you very much, Mariana. I mean, the uh, we've really quite exciting times and so much, so much revolutionary scientific background and, and discovery here, you know, that we really are leaping towards personalized therapy by being able to target disease specific treatments rather than the blanket approach. So absolutely really fascinating times.